Thank you. So I'll, I'll collect the. I'll uh, finish uh, uh, up a couple of minutes earlier today so that I can collect your papers uh, at the end of uh, at the end of class. Uh, and I will attempt to have the papers for you uh, by next week. That's not a promise, but you'll certainly have them two weeks from today. Uh, that's that. That'd be the very latest by which you would uh, have the papers uh, returned to you. All right. Okay. So uh, today we're. Uh, uh, once again, on the subject of Hinduism and the United States, I'm going to wrap up my discussion today, uh, certainly, uh, with respect to the question of uh, Hinduism. We are going to have uh, occasion to speak about Sikhism uh, later on, uh, because there is a section where I look at uh, the question of uh, minority rights and, uh, you know, uh, some of the difficulties encountered by uh, Indians, uh, whether in the United States or elsewhere in the diaspora. Uh, so there we're going to look uh, uh, at a number of case studies, and one of them is going to be the Sikhs in the United States and some of the problems that they might have had. Uh, and there will be occasion to refer to Islam as well, but that will also be uh, in, in that particular section. I mean, here what I propose to do is to, as I said, wrap up my discussion uh, of Hinduism. Uh, in the U.S., and I want to r uh, remind you uh, what I had been talking about uh, in the previous week. Uh, I had concluded my discussion uh, on Thursday with a description of a temple uh, that has recently come up. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, its inauguration took place very recently, and this is the uh, Swami Narayan Temple in Chino Hills. Right? And you recall that I had mentioned to you the particular circumstances under which this temple had come up. Uh, the Sw Swami Narayan <coughs> faith is a faith that uh, uh, can be viewed as, it, the Swami Narayan people can be viewed as a sect of Hinduism. Uh, that's, that's really the easiest way to describe it for our purposes. Uh, they themselves actually have a number of divisions within their ranks. Uh, and uh, the most uh, well-known of these three sects uh, is BAPS. Uh, it's a very affluent community, exceedingly affluent community, and I've suggested to you that one of the ways in which the Swami Narayan people make their presence felt is through these uh, really ornate, really ornate temples, uh, and I showed you slides of one of these temples in Bartlett. Uh, we will see some more slides later on, not today, uh, in a different context uh, of the temple uh, in, um, in Atlanta uh, and possibly the one in Houston as well. Right? Now, uh, we don't have time to really get into the history of the Swaminarayan sect and how it's very different, but remember that one of the reasons why the Gujarati community uh, is quite affluent uh, is, and this is not to say that all members of the community are affluent, just as uh, if you look at the Indian community as a whole, as I've tried to suggest to you, there is obviously a great deal, a great degree of affluence uh, within large sectors of the community, certainly highly educated, uh, to be highly educated is not always to be affluent, of course, um, but it, it means that there are people who are reasonably well-to-do, and then there are sectors of the community which are much less affluent, because under the INS um, Act of 1965 and the preferential category system that were set up, what, meant, what this meant was that families' reunification became uh, a desired objective, and not all members of the family uh, were equally well-educated. Right? So you, you find uh, a good number of Indians who are taxi drivers, who you know, run Dunkin' Donuts franchises, so forth and so on. Right? And then, of course, there's a very significant portion of the, of, the, of the Gujarati community which is involved in the hospitality industry, as it's known. Right? That is running motels and hotels and so on. Right? Now, nonetheless, the community has been centrally involved in things like trading for a very long period of time. And this history goes back to India itself. It's not a history uniquely of the Gujaratis uh, in the United States. Uh, it's a history of the Gujaratis in East Africa, uh, and then their migration uh, in circumstances that I've already described to you in the late 1960s, uh, early 1970s, right, to places like England. So the Swaminarayan Temple in Chino Hills is being put up by this particular community. and, and uh, those are some of the features which help us understand why these temples are relatively ornate. Okay? Now, without moving into the ideological aspects of the Swami Narayan faith, and there are ideological aspects of this faith. So the faith, for example, puts itself forward as an apolitical faith. 
And, and frankly, I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, uh, one of the things that's very disturbing, uh, and just giving you an illustration of that, just an illustration. We, we, we don't have the luxury to really move into a detailed discussion of this particular set. But in the aftermath of the September 11th bombings, okay, in 2011, in 2001, in the United States, in the aftermath of those bombings, there was a terrorist attack in India on a Hindu temple. And that Hindu temple was the Swaminarayan temple at Akshardham. So Akshardham is their world headquarters. Right? It's right very close to uh, the city of Ahmedabad, which is, which is the major industrial city, uh, uh, the city to which, in fact, actually Gandhi had returned, as I pointed out on a previous occasion, uh, uh, when he, uh, uh, the city to which he returned when he came back to India from South Africa, where he settled down. Right? So Akshardham is, 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 you could say it's, it's on the outskirts of, uh, of Ahmedabad. And the only terrorist attack that took place on a Hindu temple was at Akshardham. Why Akshardham? I mean, there are millions of temples. And you could say that, well, they picked, uh, they picked a temple that was you know, highly visible. Well, there are many Hindu temples that are highly visible. Uh, there are temples from antiquity which are of enormous size, which still exist in South India. One could think of many other temples that could have been targeted. But I, I do believe that one reason this temple was targeted is because uh, there is a feeling, uh, at least among some people, uh, and certainly among cer certain adherents of Islam in, in India, uh, that, this, that, that the Swami Narayan faith has been, in fact, what we might describe as stridently Hindu nationalistic. Right? Even though it purports to be apolitical, presents itself as apolitical. And we're not in the position here to be able to do a full evaluation of this, but it seems to me that this is certainly a factor that might have been present in the minds of those who perpetrated the terrorist attack right, at Akshardham. So one thing that, and, and you can see where this is going to lead to eventually, because one of the things I'm going to do today is to move into this whole segment on Hindu nationalism. And it's, right, the relationship between politics and religion in the Indian diaspora, particularly in the United States. Right, so, I, so keep this narrative in mind when we look at this segment shortly from now. Because at this point, I just want to reiterate a number of other considerations, some of which we have visited before, but since I'm trying to wrap up my discussion, I want to make sure that you understand very broadly what are some of the features of the Hindu landscape in the United States. So I had been suggesting to you in my previous lecture that there are certain characteristic features which one can think about when one looks at the history of Hinduism and Hindus in the United States. So for example, the transition from makeshift temples to more orthodox, more formal temples that when the community first puts down roots, right, at that point in time, they don't have the wherewithal, they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the self-confidence even perhaps, right, to be able to come up with elaborate temples, many of them built according to the formal guidelines laid down in the temple, manual ar in the, in the temple architecture manuals. Right, but over a period of time, over a period of several decades, you find that a temple Hinduism begins to develop in the United States. And in, in between, you have such movements as the Hare Krishnas, which I described to you at very considerable length. And that the Hare Krishnas themselves initially had a certain kind of Indian following as well. It was not only a following among white liberals or, or those members of the white community who now felt alienated from the dominant mainstream uh, society of the United States. Right? People who had gravitated to the spiritualism or mysticism of the East, as it was known. That the followers in, in, in the early years included Indians, but then gradually as a community gets well established. I gave you numbers from Chicago, how the numbers of Indians began to grow very substantially, so that by the mid-1980s, you're talking about communities now that certainly have the means to be able to put together right, a formal temples. And slowly you're going to find more, more Hindus gravitating towards these temples. And these temples themselves can be of various kinds. Uh, one of the things I'd suggested to you, and I want to reiterate this at this particular juncture, uh, is that 
Uh, many of these temples showed certain kinds of innovative features uh, in the 80s and 90s, and that had to do with the, the actual conditions on the ground. That even though these communities were now reasonably big, that relative to the population of America as a whole, they are still, they're still quite small, still quite minuscule. Right? So it cannot be the case that each community is going to build a temple for itself. And when I say community here now, I'm not speaking about Indians, I'm speaking about subnational categories, Gujaratis, uh, you know, Tamilians, okay, Malayalis, Punjabis, so forth and so on. So some of these temples were quite eclectic, quite eclectic. And, and if you have done the readings, you would have noticed that one of the things that has been pointed out by a couple of the authors is that some of these temples will display, so if it's a Vaishnava temple, it may have a Shaivite shrine as well, right? and vice versa. Right? So these are the ways in which they began to innovate. Then I spoke to you about the museumization of Hinduism. Again, I looked at the Swami Narayan faith here as an illustration, that in this particular temple that I mentioned to you in Bartlett, you know, there's this huge exhibition called Understanding Hinduism. It's like walking into a museum, right? It's, it doesn't necessarily give you that feeling of spirituality, partly because it's a sanitized, extremely sanitized kind of space. I mean, almost like a hospital space, frankly, if you actually go into it. Yes, I mean, there are the, there are the, the deities, and of course, if you were a believer, if you were a believer of the Swaminarayan faith, you most certainly will feel some kind of spiritual um, ecstasy being there, or spiritual, you feel spiritually at peace, but it, say you were an outsider, or say that you were a Hindu, but you did not belong to the Swami Narayan faith. So let's say someone like myself, right, who understands the religion, is born into it, but I'm obviously not an advocate of the Swami Narayan faith, right, so do I feel, do I feel that same kind of spiritual, you know, ease that I might feel at some other Hindu temple? Do I feel a sense of awe? And again, the experience of someone might, else might vary considerably. I don't want to consider my experience to be representative at all. But I'm simply saying that what I also see, in addition to the deities, is I see a kind of a museum. I see a kind of a sanitized space. Right? And so I was trying to explain to you what is the relationship between, between the idea of the museum and the project of modernity the project of modernity, right? Because one of the ways in which we try to understand modernity is through its institutions. Not only through the fact that notions of time and space got highly radicalized, the speed at which things move, but one of the fundamental institutions of modernity is precisely the, what we would call the museum. And generally you put into, put into a museum those artifacts of a culture which are part of the historical legacy. You know, one of the most chilling exhibitions I've ever seen in my life, and I don't think I would ever forget it, and this is one of the things that made me understand what the museum complex is all about. And if you go to the, the Holocaust Museum, the Simon Wiesenthal Center here in Los Angeles, okay, so I had gone there about 10 years ago with a friend of mine, and you go through the whole exhibition, and if, you know, I'm sure that all of you have been to one Holocaust museum or the other at least, at some point, and you know that it's a standard kind of exhibition, and it begins with, with uh, a description of the anti-Semitism that <coughs> began in Europe, okay, well, it didn't begin in Europe in the 19th century, it had existed for, for centuries at that point in time, but the, the exhibition would usually begin some, somewhere around the 1920s, 30s, social life in Germany and how the Jews began to already feel the oppressiveness of a certain kind of anti-Semitism that was prevalent, but now with the coming of the Nazis right, in the early 1930s, the, the establishment of the Nazi regime is going to now get institutionalized. So there are going to be a whole series of legislations, laws, then you've got the Reichstag fire of 1933, which is deliberately staged in order to scapegoat the Jews. Right? Moving through, of course, the mid-1930s, Hitler's not simply ascendancy to power, but, but the fact that he's now able to consolidate it, he's got a war machine, he's got a, a machinery of extinction that he's slowly putting into place. Then the beginnings of the war, the final solution, 1942, concentration camps, so forth and so on. A standard exhibition. Now, what was particularly chilling is when you come to the end. When you come to the end, it says very clearly 
that one of the things that the Nazis had in mind is they wanted to build a grand museum of Jewish history and culture. And you know, you think about it, what is so odd about it? What is so bizarre about it? You want to exterminate, what is the final solution? It's a desire to exterminate the Jewish race in its entirety, completely. Right? You want to exterminate the Jewish race, but you also want to build the grandest museum that you can have, which will record their history and culture and religion. Why would you want to do that if you want to wipe them out? Well, one of the reasons you want to do it is because of this enlightenment idea, going back to the late 18th century, that we must have a complete record of everything, a complete record of the history of humanity. And includes a history of people that you exterminate. Why do we know something about the Tasmanian aboriginals who were wiped out to the last person, the last person? Not a single Tasmanian aboriginal survived at the end of the 19th century. The reason we know something about them is because the same people who wiped them out, they also said, okay, let's learn something about, you know, it's like learning about dinosaurs. It's part of the fossil record. Right? So the museum is a very strange kind of institution. I'm not speaking about museums which show Picasso and Andy Warhol and Matisse and so forth and so on. I'm, I'm speaking about the vast bulk of the museums and the institution of the museum in such things as natural history, the culture of a people, you know, these ethnographic museums. Okay, and, and Washington DC of course has one now which came up a few years ago, the Museum to the American Indian, a huge museum, right? After you've nearly exterminated them and then you put up this huge grandiose thing and of course you say that you're doing it because you want to, people to understand their history and culture and so forth and so on. And we'd have to understand what is the politics of this institution called the museum. And then in particular, when we begin to look at religion, why is Hinduism appropri appropriating this museum space? Okay, So this, these are some of the ironies that you would have to begin to think about. And then finally I was telling you that look, if you look at these images, the bulk of these images at these big temples certainly, they're carved in India. They're carved in India, then they're shipped over. They're assembled here, of course. They have to be assembled here. You know, you put the edifice together, and the, and then you have craftsmen who will assemble everything together over a period of time. The priests continue to be drawn from India, um, and in fact, actually, communities are very particular about the priests that they want to preside over their affairs. So, if you go to New York. In New York, you have a very large Indo-Guyanese community. So these are Indians who have come from Guyana. And I'm speaking about a very large community. I'm not talking about five or 10,000 people. I'm talking about tens of thousands of, of Indo-Guyanese and Indo-Trinidadians. And the Indo-Guyanese, they, they have temples of their own. And they prefer to have priests who are certainly of Indian origin, but they're Indo-Guyanese priests. And because the idea is that the priest should be somebody who's familiar with the community. And that's certainly true of all religions, that people prefer to, why do people go to a neighborhood church? Because if, you know, you become familiar with the pastor, the pastor then becomes somebody who gives you not simply spiritual guidance, but guidance on family matters, so forth and so on. Right, so, so these are some of the characteristic features having to do with the growth of Hinduism. Now let me add a few more things to this picture before I wrap up my discussion here and move on to the next phase. And one of the features that I want to dwell upon is the, the synchronization of the Hindu calendar and the American secular calendar. The synchronization of American secular ideas of freedom and <laughs> Hindu ideas of freedom. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by these two different propositions? What I mean by that is the following, that many of these Hindu temples, um, a very good illustration is this temple uh, about which you have the reading. And right? if you've done the reading, 
So there's an article by Vasudha Narayan creating the South Indian Hindu experience in the United States. And what is she discussing in this particular reading? What she's discussing in this particular reading is a temple which uh, is in Penn Hills in Pennsylvania. Okay, It's a Sri Venkateshwar temple, a Vishnu temple. Um, and this particular temple, she points out, if you look at its history, this particular temple's uh, inauguration okay, took place in 19. 76. Right? Why is 1976 important? 1976 is important. It's the bicentennial of the American Revolution. Okay? Many of these temples are going to be inaugurated on July 4th. July 4th. And of course, I don't have to explain to anybody in this room the significance of July 4th. I, the many illustrations. Exactly the same thing that happened in Chicago, at the Greater Hindu Temple in Chicago. Okay, construction of this temple started in 1976, this particular Sri Venkateshwar temple. So what we're talking about is two different phenomena. This particular example, in fact, actually speaks to two different phenomena that I've mentioned to you. One is the synchronization of these calendars. So you want to, you want to, you're an Indian, you're a Hindu, you're living in the United States. You want to show that you are a faithful, loyal subject of this country. And yet, of course, you delight in your Hindu heritage, your Indian heritage. Right? That forms part of your identity. So this is why this synchronization is important. And, and, and in this particular uh, uh, you know, article that we have over here, let me just look at another example. So page 159, if you, if you don't have the book with you, it doesn't matter. Okay. So the, this particular temple, in 1988, it produced a bulletin. You know, it produces a bulletin frequently. And this is a bulletin from 1988, uh, page 159. Maha Brahmutsam was celebrated during the 4th of July weekend. Right? Brahmo Utsavam is the festival of Brahma. Labor Day weekend celebration, I'm quoting. Labor Day weekend celebration will be climaxed by a Pushpa Palaki. A float decorated with flowers and lights. Right? So here's another illustration. Synchronization of these. Because you're showing your respect for American holidays. And to the extent you, you can shift Hindu holidays as well as they do here. right? To give you the long weekend. Most of the holidays here are not actually observed on the day of that particular event. They, they're usually observed on a Friday or a Monday to give you that long weekend. And they're following the same principle here to some degree. Other religious and cultural events planned for the Labor Day weekend are listed, so forth and so on. So this synchronization is an interesting and characteristic feature of how Hinduism has worked here. Now, the second aspect of this synchronization is that many Hindus, I would argue, in the US would claim that they are uniquely positioned among all people in the world. Why are they uniquely positioned? Because A, they are the beneficiaries of American notions of secular freedom, that this country has been a beacon of freedom, democracy, liberty, right? Its icons include the Statue of Liberty, give me your huddled masses, so forth and so on. Just be sure you have you know, a PhD or a, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, you're a great artist and it'll be a little bit easier to come in, but the rhetoric is give me your huddled masses, so forth and so on, and I'll take all of them. Right? The, the, the idea of freedom, liberty, democracy is central to America revolution spreading a certain message about itself. Now, what makes the, in, the Hindu especially privileged is because the Hindu brings his own conception of spiritual freedom. F going back to the period of the ancient Vedas. That what is the Indian spiritual, what is the Hindu spiritual experience it all about? It's about self-emancipation. About attaining moksha. Moksha is liberation. Right? So the, the, the economic and political liberation that is promised in the United States is complemented beautifully, according to the Hindu, by the traditions of spiritual emancipation which he and or she can legitimately claim as their own. And this is what makes the Hindu specially positioned. Right? This, is, this is the synchronization. 
that I think is really quite unique and the Hindu self presentation of who they are and why the Hindu has a special kind of place in the history of the United States. All right, so these are some other elements of this, you know, of what I'm describing as a characteristic features of the landscape of religion, particularly of Hinduism in the United States. There are some other features which I mentioned in the book, which are mentioned in some of the other readings. I won't really go into them, um, uh, such, as, such as, for example, the fact that uh, if you look at the Hindu temple uh, in the US, certainly most Hindu temples, uh, not necessarily true of all of them, but most Hindu temples, they in fact are not only temples, they also serve as cultural centers. Right? So, you know, the, the, these are the centers where there will be uh, uh, classes given in Bharatanatyam and Kathak. Uh, this is where you can learn yoga and Hindi. This is where Indian families can send their children. So instead of sending them to Sunday school, you send them to a Bal Vihar. And I'm sure that many Indians, you know, uh, 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 you know, of your generation have had some experience of that kind if you've gone to one of these temples. So they double up as cultural centers, as community centers, so forth and so on. And, and that has to do partly again with the diasporic location. Now it's certainly true that this can happen in India as well, but to a much lesser degree. Uh, the most that could happen is that in most uh, neighborhood temples uh, in, in, in India, uh, a homeopath doctor will come in the evening there for two hours and dispense homeopathic medicine. And that's about the most that you would really see by way of innovation. Uh, here, the, the temple really does serve as a community center as well. All right. Now, are there any questions about this segment of my description of Hinduism in the U.S.? Madhu. Um, what is the Hindu conception of spiritual freedom as opposed to, say, the Buddhist conception of Oh, the, the Hindu here is not saying that others may not have, right? Some conception of spiritual freedom. I mean, what is the notion of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, emancipation, okay, uh, in the Christian tradition? Ah, the Hindu will certainly concede the fact that if you are a Christian and you believe in Jesus Christ and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, right? They, you know, that, that, that certain consequences may follow, you know. Okay, I mean, the Hindu is not denying that. But the idea here is that Hinduism is specially positioned to en enable people to understand the idea of self emancipation, self liberation. And as far as Buddhism goes, the Hindu would have no problem with that. But as far as they're concerned, Buddhists are really Hindus. I mean, these particular Hindus who believe that, they would have no problem at all with your claim that this might be true of Buddhism as well. But you know that if you look at the long history of, Hindu, of Hinduism and, and its relationship with Buddhism, there are still a substantial number of Hindus all over the world who would claim that Buddhists really, frankly, are Hindus. I mean, they just call themselves by a different name. And, uh, and we do know that, that in many canons of Hinduism, so to speak, the Buddha himself became an avatar of Vishnu, of the god Vishnu. Right? So there's no difficulty there at all. Yeah, the Christ Christianity and Islam might promise something like redemption, but redemption is not the same as, from the point of view of the Hindu, as self-emancipation of the kind that the Hindu texts have been right, giving us illustrations of for thousands of years. That, that would be the claim. Yes? I'm still a little confused. At the very beginning, you mentioned the, the reaction to the 9-11 uh, events as Akshardham. Uh, that, that there was a uh, uh, an, atta uh, an attack on a Hindu temple. Yeah. But all of the perpetrators of 9/11 were yeah. Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I didn't give you the missing links. The missing links have to do with the fact that after 9/11, okay, this question is absolutely legitimate. Um, I should have given the missing link. The missing link is that after 9/11. And in fact, I'm glad you asked a question because this will help us understand what's happening with Hindu nationalism in the U.S. After the events of 9-11, in large parts of the world, such as India, there was a widespread feeling that if you wanted to take out your anger on Muslims, you could do so and there would be no consequences for you at all. Okay, That there would be no consequences for you at all. Now, the consequence of this was that in the state of Gujarat, in February 
following okay, the attacks here. And the following year, you had what can only be described, frankly, as a pogrom that took place against Muslims in the state of Gujarat. Right? So over a period of several days, I mean, some of the atrocities went on for a few weeks, but over a period of several days, particularly, a few thousand Muslims were killed in Gujarat. And of course at that, because essentially, and frankly, there were no consequences. No consequences. The most shameful thing you can think of, no consequences for any of the perpetrators. Only very recently, by the way, have a handful of people been finally brought to trial and been convicted. Only very recently, 10 years after the fact. But we are talking about the complicity of a large number of people who essentially understood that they had the green light from the state of Gujarat to massacre Muslims and there would be no consequences to pay. Nobody in the United States would shout and say, hey, Muslims are being killed in India because there was such anger against Muslims even here that it wasn't understood that if you committed atrocities against Muslims, people were going to overlook them. All right? And it is precisely in the state of Gujarat that the attack on Akshardham took place several weeks after this pogrom against Muslims. That's a missing link. Okay? Because there was, there was a widespread sentiment that, that atrocities against Muslims are being tolerated. And we're not talking about, you know, minor acts of discrimination. I'm talking about people being killed wholesale, butchered wholesale. And that nobody is being asked to pay the consequences for these atrocities. And so, so, so of course, there were people in the Muslim community who decided they would retaliate. And what is their act of retaliation? They launch an attack at the temple at Akshardham. The question now is why that temple at Akshardham? And that has to do with the fact that, the, of course it happened in Gujarat, the atrocities took place in Gujarat, so you pick a temple in Gujarat, but there are thousands of temples in Gujarat. You know, why do you pick, why do you pick the Akshardham temple, which is the world headquarters of the Swaminarayan faith? And that has to do with the general sentiment I would argue, among members of the, of the Muslim community, certainly some members of the Muslim community, that the Swami Narayan faith uh, has been stridently pro-Hindu and anti-Muslim. Even though it purports to present itself as entirely apolitical, entirely apolitical. Right? And, you know, and if somebody said, well, what is the evidence? Well, then you just have to really know what the history of the Swami Narayan faith is throughout the last two, three decades and how the community is perceived by Muslims, right? So forth and so on. Is that answer your question? Yes, but yeah. there, there was a long history of that before. A long history of what? Of, of uh, Muslim, Hindu. Uh, oh, no, but, oh, yeah. But there may be a long history, but we'd have to understand what you mean by long. There is the short long and there's a long long. I mean, even under the British, yeah. that would say. Yeah, because, you know, the colonial view was that Hindus and Muslims have always been you know, fighting each other, but that's a colonial view, all right? Uh, but you see, the, the program that took place against Muslims in 2002, this is of a different magnitude than anything that had been seen. The only comparable example, the only comparable example would be the killings that took place of the Sikhs in 1984 after the assassination of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, right? by her own Sikh bodyguards. Okay? And at that point you had a pogrom that took place against the Sikhs in the capital. Right? But it lasted over two, three days. The Gujarat killings did not last over two, three days. These went on for a long period of time. 200,000 people were displaced from their homes. The vast bulk of them, even today, have not been settled back in their homes. They're still refugees. As citizens, they're still refugees in their own state. That's what we're speaking about. Yeah. All right. Any, any other questions? Okay. Now, let me move to a related segment, but the next segment, and this is what I'm calling Internet Hinduism. Okay. So let me just, before I even venture into this, let me just throw out a question and see if you want to take a stab at it. How do you suppose that the internet might have changed 
something about the practices of Hinduism among Hindus living here. Does anybody, can anybody, I mean some of you might already know because of, you know, if you're practicing Hindus you might already have had occasion to deploy the internet in one way or the other. Can anybody give me an illustration? Live videos, yes, uh, that's true, but uh, so for example, I mean, they very recently had what's called the Kumbh Mela, right? If you've been reading, the, if you read the New York Times, there were several articles. So the Kumbh Mela is, uh, is usually described as the largest gathering of, of people ever in the world. And it takes place, there's the Maha Kumbh Mela, which is the grand Kumbh Mela, then there are the smaller ones. The smaller one means 10, 15 million people, the Maha one means... 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 million people are coming together uh, in a place like Allahabad over a period of several weeks. It's a, it's a sea of humanity, right? And so you could, say, you could say that, okay, well, there might have been some live videos there and you see it, but that's like consumption. You're sitting here, okay, and you're consuming these images. And the real question here would be, the real question for you is how do practices of Hinduism change? How does our understanding of Hinduism change on account of the internet? Because I think surely all of you would agree that perhaps one of the two or three most significant changes in the course of the last two decades, in your lifetime for most of you, in other words, right, has been the advent of the internet, digital technologies, <coughs> and so on and so forth. Right? So what, what might be some of the things that would come to the fore? Yes? If you don't have access to a temple, then you do what, sorry? Okay, so you, you, the, the internet becomes a source of information, right? And you're sitting here, uh, let's say you were sitting in a very small town, a very, very small town, um, you know, population of a few hundred, you happen to be uh, one of two or three only Indians there, you're trying to find out, well, when is Diwali? When is Holi? What, something like that. Yes, I agree with you, but how about something a bit more dramatic or exciting, potentially? Right, because that would be like, effectively like going to an encyclopedia. It's just that now you get it instantly at your fingertips. So you all, you, all you have to do is just go to the internet, you know, and type in when is Diwali and, psh, you know, there'll be 100,000 sites which will claim to tell you the answer. Okay, but how about something else? Yes? Okay, transnational solidarity. That's, that's, uh, that is, I think, a very important consideration. I'm going to speak to that, uh, but uh, before we get to that, how about something like, okay, so for example, you know, let's say among Muslims, I know that there are many such sites because, you know, I look at, I, I mean, I'm a student of religion, so I look at these sites, you know, that if you're a Muslim here uh, and you want uh, advice, you can go on the internet and you can get in touch with a Malvi, okay? A Malvi is a Muslim priest, essentially. You can get in touch with a Malvi. You know, you wanted advice about, about certain rights, uh, about how, for example, to conduct circumcision for a boy. Let's suppose you wanted information on that. Right? And, and so you could go, and in fact, you can do these online chats as well. And this, all this is now being documented and studied by scholars. Right? Because that's what scholars do. First the practice takes place and then the scholars come along and try to figure out. The practice always precedes the theory, usually. The scholars like to believe that it's their theory that's influenced in the practice. I think it's the other way around. You know, there's a set of practices and then the scholars come into the game a little bit later on and then say, okay, let me try to figure out what's going on because things are changing very fast on the ground. So I'll give you, rather than taking up more time, I'll, I'll give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Online puja. Okay, online puja. Now some of you, and go check it out on the internet. Type in online puja. So you're sitting here. Uh, you have a son or a daughter, and you would love to get your son or daughter into Harvard or Princeton. And you say, okay, I'm going to do an online puja. So you go to a 
the site of a renowned temple in India, let's say Tirupati temple, and click on that site, or some other temple site, and you put in your credit card, it'll say, do you want to do an online puja? Yes, so you put in your credit card number, okay, and it'll tell you the cost is $40, uh, and they'll have a priest do the puja for you to make things auspicious, right? That's the whole idea. Sometimes, by the way, some of the sites are now trying to simulate the puja because, you know, the puja, the Hindu puja is a complete sensory experience. It's a complete sensory experience. Uh, and a puja is uh, a, a, what we're calling a Hindu forms of worship, Hindu form of worship. So in a puja, there can be different kinds of pujas, but I'm just giving you, let's say, a generic description of a puja. So you burn incense. Uh, in a temple, you know, when you enter, you would even, be, you could do the puja, by the way, at a temple, or you can simply call the priest to your home. And you can, you can have a little fire and do it around that in your own home. And you sit around the fire, the priest is there, he'll uh, chant some mantras in Sanskrit. Uh, let's hope he's chanting the right ones. Uh, because most of the people who are listening to these chants are absolutely clueless, of course, about what the priest is saying, right? And he may be e equally clueless. That's what I'm suggesting in some cases, and particularly in the diaspora context, because who's there to really check up on his authority uh, in these matters? Okay? And so, you know, he says some mantras, uh, then you put oblations into the fire. Okay? So you've got, you can see how it's a complete sensory experience. In the, temp in the temple, by the way, there would be, you know, you would clang the bells. Uh, and by the way, when the, you do an arti, when um, the, the person brings a tray and there's a little fire on it and they might clang a little bell. So all your senses are involved in it. And the website might even simulate this. Now, when you do the online puja uh, at one of these temples in India, so you put in the credit card number, they'll perform the puja for you. And guess what? They will even send the prasad by airmail. So prasadam is the holy food. Okay, so after, after, the, after the puja, there's usually an offering. And this is, includes food that has been sanctified. So they'll airlift a little box of halwa or whatever it is to you over here. Right? Now, let's complicate it a bit more. Let's really complicate this a bit more. See, if you go to a Hindu home, an observant Hindu home. I mean, many Hindus will not have such thing, but let's say you were a reasonably devout Hindu. You have a little place in your home, which is the mandir, the temple. You create a temple in your own home. So it could be an entire room. It could be a small alcove, right? So within the foyer, a little space, for example. And what do you do? It's, a, it's essentially an altar place. That's what we're saying it is, right? What do you do? You install the images of the deities there. And you will see that in many Hindu homes. By no, by no means is this unique. This is exceedingly common. Okay? And you will see several images that have been installed there. Now, one thing that is quite certain is that even if you do not keep the rest of your house clean, you will certainly keep usually the altar place clean. You clean, you clean it, you know, you take a duster or whatever it is and you remove the dust and you keep this place clean. Okay. However, now imagine that you were doing an online puja. And imagine, why do we have to imagine there are people who do this? But imagine that before you, because what is, when you do an online puja, you're doing a holy act, just as though you were doing a puja in person. So imagine that on that same computer, 20 minutes before you start your online puja, you've been watching hardcore pornography <laughs> on that same computer. So what do you do? How do you clean the computer? Well, yeah, there are ways in which you clean it. You, you, you know, you delete the files. Okay, you go to your f server and make sure, that, you know, erase all history going back to 24 hours. Okay, then you put it in trash and then you empty the trash, right? You clean it out as much as you can. Okay, is, is this the same phenomenon? Because there are surely people who must be doing these things. We shouldn't assume, by the way, that people who are highly religious never see pornography. 
and that likewise people who see pornography are not highly religious. There will always be a subset of people who do both these things. Unquestionably so. Okay. So what are the complications that are introduced when religion becomes right, a part of the digital landscape? That's the question you have to think about. And this question is not going to go away. This will become more and more pressing with time. Because frankly, this is becoming the dominant form of religiosity for some people. Is to go on the internet. Right? So there was, a, uh, there was a suggestion that was made, and a suggestion I agree with entirely, that, that one of the things that people do is they, they create transnational links. Right? And I'll speak to that in a moment. But I'm saying to you that if you look at it in the totality of things, it's very clear that there are many different aspects to this phenomenon, namely when religion enters into cyberspace. What are the ramifications? What are the consequences? What are the transformations? Is it going to lead us to alter our conception of religion? Right? And how, how do people maintain their faith even transform it, change it under such circumstances. So this is what leads me to this next segment. But all the here, I'm going to give you a different aspect of the story. Um, and this aspect of the story is best understood if you keep in mind what I mentioned to you in my previous lecture, namely that in India itself, beginning in the late 1970s, down to the present day, over the course of the last three, three and a half decades, one of the most fundamental political transformations has been the rise of what we would call Hindu nationalism. And I described to you the structure, the institutional structure of Hindu nationalism, the BJP, the political party, the VHP, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, that does what you might call the cultural work of Hinduism, and the RSS, which is sort of the ideological fount of Hindu nationalism and a number of other organizations. We don't need to concern ourselves with the histories of all of these organizations, but that's, the, that's sort of the institutional structure of which explains the rise of Hindu nationalism. Now, in the Indian community here, the, and specifically in the Hindu community, which accounts for the bulk of the Indians living in the United States, you see similar tendencies, quite naturally. In fact, there is obviously a relationship between, between what's happening in India and, and how the Hindu community here is partaking of some of those same sentiments. You could even argue, as I would, certainly, that if anything, the Hindu community here is more nationalist than the Hindu community in India. And I don't think, by the way, this is particular to Hindus. I, I think that you find, uh, find exactly the same phenomenon when you look at Islam, when you look at... Uh, Judaism, okay, when you, when you look at Sikhism. That in, in India itself, if you look at the case of the Sikhs, in the late 1970s again, moving into the 1980s, up till about the mid-1990s, when finally this movement was more or less crushed, you had a Sikh secessionist movement. Sikhs who, as, if, as I'm arguing, wanted to carve out a separate nation state, Khalistan, a separate nation state. Now many of the adherents of Sikh secessionism fled India. The reason they fled India was quite obvious because they were going to be persecuted. And they thought that they could make, they had, they had a, a better chance of propagating their point, point of view, their worldview, if they could do so from Canada or the United States or Britain, the three major destinations for these secessionist Sikhs. And long after, long after, support for Sikh secessionism died down within the Sikh community or the bulk of the Sikh community in India. Long after that, support for Sikh secessionism still continued in these parts of the diaspora in very big ways. I think that this is unquestionably true. And, and there are dramatic illustrations of this. There are dramatic illustrations of how certain ideological positions become hardened. I'll give you another illustration of that. 
Uh, so this is also now introducing a bit of discussion of Sikhism as well, and then we'll return to this question, as I said, in a later segment of the course. The illustration I want to give you is the following, without giving you a very detailed history, but just enough so that you understand the illustration, that one of the arguments advanced by the founders of Sikhism was that Sikhism would be a faith that would promise equality to everybody. That the caste system, which constrained the lives of millions of Hindus, would not really be of any consequence. You could be a Sikh and you could come from the lowest segments of the Hindu community, a low caste person, you could come from the middling caste, it made no difference. Right? So this idea of equality is at least as far as the faith's own representation of itself is concerned, it's a central element of that faith. And one of the ways in which this, this has been expressed in the Sikh religion is through the institution of what is called the langar. So what is this? This is a communal meal. And incidentally, I encourage all of you to go to a Gurdwara event in the greater Los Angeles area where they will serve langar. And what is langar? It's a communal meal and all of you sit on the ground next to each other. Doesn't matter what your origins, who you are. Okay. And then people will come and they will serve you a meal. So, the, so this, was, this institution of this was designed precisely to, to offer a countervailing force against the orthodoxies of the caste system. So there are no, there's no, there are no you know, chairs or tables or anything. Why are there no chairs and tables? Everybody sits on the ground. Why are there no chairs and tables? Because the minute you introduce furniture, you introduce a hierarchy. I would encourage you all, by the way, to read one of the great masterpieces of American literature, completely forgotten. It's called The Philosophy of Furniture by Edgar Allan Poe, the great American poet of the 19th century. The Philosophy of Furniture. And furniture does introduce hierarchy. How does it introduce hierarchy? For example, look at the English expression. He or she sits at the head of the table. Okay, one reason why some organizations prefer a round table is because nobody sits at the head of that table. Right? But if you have a rectangular table, these are all rectangular tables. Somebody sits at the head of the table. And always in the dining table, which are usually, certainly in that traditional form, has been a rectangular table where somebody sits at the head of it. And it's not simply a matter of sitting at the head of the table. Who sits at the table and who doesn't? Uh, in many parts of India, if you belong to the lower working class, you know, lower caste, and you go to the home of the person who's employed you, and your employer wants to have a conversation with you, the person, you know, the, the maid, the driver, they'll immediately sit on the ground. It's, they understand tacitly they're not to sit on the sofa or on a chair. Uh, they're hierarchies that are established by furniture. Okay? I, let's not, we, I can't dwell on it at enormous length, but I think I've established a point. Now, the relationship of all of this is that in Vancouver, where you have a large Sikh population, very recently, several years ago, they had a big, big dispute over tables and chairs. Because in the Gurdwara, some people wanted to introduce chairs and tables. And some Orthodox Sikhs said, you cannot do that because it will, it will destroy the spirit of the Sikh faith. Because they understand tacitly what it meant. Then some people said, well, the reason we want to introduce them is because, frankly, there are people who are elderly and they've got arthritis and, you know, it's a bit of a pain for them to sit cross-legged on the floor. So, you know, there were people who were arguing it. It led to blows and eventually the cops had to be called in because a number of people were stabbed. So this is the fight over chairs and tables in a Gurdwara. It's, you can find details of this if you go on the internet. And many people would think this is incredibly bizarre. Well, if you understand the cultural context, then you know, you see, what is happening here. 
Okay? So why am I mentioning all of this now? I'm mentioning all of this because before we look at internet Hinduism, I'm giving you an illustration here from a different faith and I'm making a number of propositions. One of those propositions that I'm advancing for you is that very often there are certain ideological forms that the religion takes place in the diaspora and these ideological forms take a more strident form and sometimes a more rigid form here than they do back in the home country itself. I mean, I would argue that, that there are more proponents, more rigid proponents of Zionism here than they are in Israel itself. That the most orthodox Sikhs, I mean the most orthodox Jews that you will find are not really in Israel, more so in the United States. And it is certainly true that if you look at the rise of Islamic extremism, a large number of the people who have been involved in this are people who come from diasporic Islamic communities. 19 of the 20 bombers involved in these September 11th bombings, yeah, these are not people who are peasants or villagers or this or that. All of them, nearly all of them had degrees from institutions in the US and UK and so on. Okay. So, so this phenomenon is going to be worthwhile keeping in mind. The radicalization, which is not unique, I'm saying, to the Muslim community. The radicalization of religious communities in the diaspora is a common feature of the history of the diaspora. And that doesn't mean the whole diaspora. I do not believe, for example, that you will find support for these more orthodox, rigid, and extremist forms of Hindu nationalism in, for example, places such as Guyana and Trinidad and Suriname. No, I think you, in the older diaspora that will not be the case. It will be the case here. Partly it will be the case here in the US because the community is more educated, it's more affluent, it's more likely to want to use its muscle power to influence the course of things. So when there was a rise of nationalism in India, and you just have to accept that for a fact that there was, we haven't, I haven't demonstrated it because then I'll have to get into the whole history of Hindu nationalism in, uh, in India and what were the circumstances under which Hindu nationalism arose in India. But the indisputable fact of the matter is that, that certainly by the early 1980s, Hindu nationalism had become a major force in Indian politics to the extent that in 1992, on 6th December 1992, uh, a 16th century mosque was destroyed by a crowd of 20,000 Hindus, a 16th century mosque. And it was destroyed because the Hindu nationalists and their supporters who destroyed the mosque claimed that this mosque itself had been built at the very same spot at which a very special sacred Hindu temple had originally been built. That this Hindu temple had then been destroyed by the Muslims in the 16th century. And this mosque now stood as a living testament to the humiliation of the Hindus and therefore had to be removed. And it was removed. It was destroyed on 6 December 1992. This could not have happened unless you had a substantial amount of political patronage extended to these people. Okay, so Hindu nationalism has been a force in Indian politics. And correspondingly, it starts to become a force among the Hindus living in the United States. In fact, the destruction of the Babri Masjid, this is the mosque I'm talking about, it's called the Babri Masjid. Uh, the destruction of the Babri Masjid elicit, elicited uh, 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 a number of you know, uh, responses among uh, Orthodox Hindus in the United States, many of whom actually claimed that, well, frankly, the mosque should have been destroyed a long time ago. And even before it was destroyed, the major Indian American newspapers Ads had been taken out by the VHP suggesting why this mosque did not deserve to stand at that spot. Explicit ads brought out by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. Okay? All of this is documented in part in the article that I've written which you're reading as well, so I won't get into the details. What I've so far tried to establish is that when you have the rise of Hindu nationalism in, the United, in, in India, you see a corresponding rise in the United States. And in fact, sometimes it takes certain forms here which 
are less prevalent in India and that includes the deployment of the internet. Now let me say a few words about the deployment of the internet, the particular circumstances. To understand the circumstances you have to understand that if you go to a place like Silicon Valley, you know that it has been estimated that about 25 to 30 percent of all the startups in Silicon Valley are run by Indians. 25 to 30 percent. That's an astronomical figure given their proportion of the population which is slightly less than one percent. And you had a very substantial number of graduate students, usually single male graduate students. There are some exceptions. Some may be married, there may be some female, single female graduate students. The bulk of them, we're talking about single male graduate students. When computer science became a well-established field, and you could start earning doctorates especially, a large number of Indian male graduate students started taking up computer science as a field of study. Not all of them, or not all of the people I'm speaking about are single male graduate students in computer science. In fact, the majority of them, that, that might be the largest chunk here, but the majority of them would actually be male graduate students from India studying you know, physics or mathematics or electrical engineering and so forth and so on. Now in their evenings, many of them, when the internet started to mushroom, many of them started going on the internet and essentially establishing websites. One of the very first websites that was established years ago, in fact I, I wrote this article that, you've, that you're reading by myself, the early version of it came out 15 years ago. And uh, Global Hindu Electronics Networks, GEN, that was the acronym. And if you went to GEN, now it's been absorbed um, uh, under a different site. Okay? Uh, but if you went to this Global Hindu Electronic Network, uh, for example, in the early 1990s, you know, when, frankly, the internet is really, and the World Wide Web is really in its infancy, particularly the World Wide Web is in its infancy at this point. Email was already being used a bit, quite a bit. You know, when I came here in 1993, you know, we, we got an email account immediately, and, and most of the correspondence was already occurring through email at that point in time. But the World Wide Web was really in its infancy at this point in time. It had been around for a few years, sites were coming up, and there is no question, by the way, that the right wing, and here I'm speaking not only about the Hindu right wing, the right wing was extremely active, extremely active. The number of anti-Semitic sites, okay, and staunchly neo-Nazi websites was quite high already. This has been well documented again by the early to mid-1990s. And this is an interesting phenomenon, I'm just making that as an observation, you mull over it, whether you agree with it or not, I think that the right wing always deploys these technologies much more aggressively than do liberals and progressives. Much more aggressive use by people on the right of these internet technologies, down to the present day. Now, Global Hindu Electronic Network, you know, if you went to this site, it was massive, considering how early it had been put on. Okay, and the bulk of these people who worked on these sites, who were these people? Right? And in some cases we know something, we don't know very much by the way, about most of the people who worked on these kinds of sites. But as I'm suggesting to you, it was largely, and in this case by the way, we know there's an Indian by the name of Ajay Shah who had come as a graduate student, you know, he's, he, he, he was studying, uh, 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 I think it was chemistry, he was doing a PhD in chemistry. I've, I've mentioned him in the book, I can't remember the details, and then eventually he settled down in San Diego, which is where he lives, and he's, he's been quite uh, instrumental in the early history of using the internet uh, for certain kinds of political purposes. Okay? But there were many other graduate in male students, and these people in fact fashioned a new kind of history of India. A new kind of history of India. But let me go back to this uh, PowerPoint and begin with this here. So uh, 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 the first slide that you're seeing over here, the join the cyber activist group, that, that of these, these groups are, are very active. 
Okay, and when I say these groups, what I'm talking about is essentially Hindu nationalists who have now formed themselves into various kinds of organizations. And sometimes I'm speaking about the VHP, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad America branch, and the cyber activists. So this is a call for people to become cyber activists and join a cyber activist group. The, the, uh, for, uh, if you look at the top, right, for establishment of the Hindu nation, what is that? Establishment of the Hindu nation. Right? Because this is, of course, part of the ideology of Hindu nationalism. And, that, and I'm not saying, by the way, that, that, that it is unilaterally so for all Hindu nationalists. There are different schools of thought. But one dominant school of thought has argued that India is quintessentially the land of Hindus. And they always want to know, they always rhetorically ask the question, since Pakistan was created as a separate nation state for Muslims in 1947, how come there are so many Muslims in India today? Right? This is rhetorically always a question because you know that the largest Muslim population in the world today is not in the Middle East. It's in South Asia. The three countries of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh together account for a huge chunk of the Muslim population. And of course in the United States there's very little awareness of, awareness of that because the minute you mention Islam everybody thinks, ah, Middle East, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or Iran or Iraq, whatever the case might be. Nobody thinks of South Asia. But, but India has one of the three largest population of Muslims in the world. Right? India, Pakistan and Indonesia are the three largest Muslim countries in the world, none of them in the Middle East. So the, rhetorically the question is 1947 India was partitioned, a separate nation state came about which became the nation state de facto for the Muslims called Pakistan and how come India still has so many Muslims? And so the Hindu nationalists would say the problem with us Hindus is we're too tolerant. We're just way too tolerant. We need to be we need to learn to be much less tolerant towards the Muslims. And we need to turn India into a Hindu nation. Now there is substantial support for this. I'm suggesting to you, among certain sectors of the community, both in India and the Hindu community in the United States. I'm not saying this is true of all Hindus. Let, let me be very clear about that. Obviously there are constituencies which are more attracted to this argument than others. And there are other constituencies which quite rightly find the argument unacceptable. But this is in any case a call for cyber activists and this is the global Hindu electronic network. So this is the origins of these sites goes back to this global Hindu electronic network. Um, I'll, I'll turn to this slide later on uh, because we are not going to be able to finish uh, this particular PowerPoint today. And then there's this I want to give you an illustration of what are the different ways in which, in which the Hindu nationalists work. Okay? So, so in fact, actually, let me, let me, in fact, let me correct myself and turn back to this slide. And let me give you a little illustration of what are some of the kinds of issues that come up. Okay? And one of the issues that came up was um, in the school of California, I, I mean, in the state of California, uh, as is true of all other states, you have a mandatory review of textbooks. So in the state of California, there is a mandatory review of textbooks, let's say history textbooks, every six, seven years. Now when this last review came up, members of the Hindu community, some members of the Hindu community, naturally, not all, some members of the Hindu community surveyed the history textbooks for grades 6 and 7 and said, hey, these are all the things that we find objectionable that have been mentioned about ancient India, Indians and Hindus. They gave a list of 225 some problems that they found in these history textbooks. So for example, uh, and some of them, by the way, they were quite right about it and nobody had any objection to saying that, well, it's, we need to rectify this error. So somewhere in one of those textbooks, it, it, was, it said that Sanskrit was originally written in the Arabic script. Complete nonsense, of course. And, you know, everybody knows that that's completely incorrect. And so they said, well, this needs to be removed. And of course, everybody said, yeah, we'll remove it. However, 
there were claims that were much more controversial. So for example, the history textbook said that in ancient India, men had more rights than women. And these Hindus, some of them went up in arms. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is true of the Christian world. This was never true of India. In India, we have revered women as the goddess. You know, we worship women. And where in Hindu texts can you find any evidence that women were treated as second class citizens? Well, I think the fact of the matter, indisputably, frankly, right, without again a long discussion, because then we'll have to take another class, I think indisputably the fact is that women generally in virtually every civilization I can think of had fewer rights, more second class citizens than men. Now, yes, there might be ways in which we can modify some propositions here and there, but, you know, I, frankly, I don't think that that is really something that can be disputed. Okay? And there are always <laughs> going to be attempts made to say, because, for example, in Islam, this is a big discussion. One of the most common critiques of Islam is that, you know, women have a second class status. And then you'll get some Muslims saying, no, 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 the Quran is very clear. Women have equal rights as men, etc., etc. You know, frankly, if you look at the practice, it's very clear that there have been problems in how women have been treated in every civilization in the world. Okay? So now, what did the, the community here did? Okay? What they said was, no, we don't accept this. They, they suggested a change. What is the change that they suggested? They said women had different rights than men. I don't, I don't know, what, that, what is that supposed to be? Different rights than men. You know? Right? Well, uh, yes, it's certainly true that they probably will have some rights having to do with their sphere of life. Okay? With their sphere of life, they go through different rights of puberty and different biological cycles, and there might, might be some rights associated with that, which would be different. But this was, of course, a way to get out of it and say, no, 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 we had, you know, women had the same status as men did. It's just that there are some differences that we recognize, and surely we, rec we all of us can see that we have to recognize these differences even today. That's how they're thinking through it. Right? Another illustration, the text said, Hinduism is a polytheistic faith. Again, the Hindus who got highly offended and said, no, 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 Hindu is a monotheistic faith. The reason they're saying that, of course, is that polytheism is generally within the worldview of the Semitic faiths. Within the worldview of the Abrahamic faiths, polytheism traditionally has been viewed as something which is unacceptable. You know, po the polytheistic faiths are not quite proper religions, according to this worldview. So that's why the Hindus are taking offense. But the problem, of course, is that polytheism and monotheism, both of them are categories derived from a study of religions in the West. The Hindus would not characterize themselves either as polytheistic or monotheistic. These are, you see, that's always the problem when you're studying these civilizations. You take terms from the civilization that you know, and then you think, ah, I'm going to apply them across the board to all of these other places. Okay? So this is an illustration. So what did they do? They waged a huge campaign, huge campaign, largely over the internet, to have their proposed changes installed into the new textbooks. And then, of course, there were people who, from the other side, including most of the people who professionally study India and, Indi and Hinduism and ancient Indian history. So, for example, I wrote a long article on this. You know, I tried to intervene in my own way because I did not agree with some of the changes that they were proposing, such as this idea that women and men had different rights. I, I don't agree with that proposition. And I think that we have to be very clear. And one of the interesting things, which I'm just going to mention, I'm going to elaborate on it in my next lecture, is that they came up with a strategy. So California parents for the equalization of educational materials. Sounds very nice, right? I mean, who could possibly disagree? 
California parents who agree that yes, all communities should be treated equally. This organization is a Hindu nationalist organization. You just put an anodyne name. It's like buying, you know, instead of buying, you know, uh, expensive cancer medication under its name, which uh, you, you, you know, you, you buy it under the generic. This is a generic form. Why did they put this in the generic form? Because they said, well, you read California parents for the equalization of educational material. Nobody could possibly disagree, right? But then you've got to start getting into the smaller print. And this is the acronym CAPIM. Was CAPIM was formed to represent parents in California. So they're saying, look, we're parents, number one. We're concerned. Number two, we're California parents. We're exercising our rights as citizens of California. We are, in fact, performing our duty. Many parents don't even do that. Look at us. We're so concerned. Right? And then equalization. We're not saying that Hindus should get more rights or should get better representation. We're just claiming that we believe in equality. Don't all Americans believe in equality? Of educational materials. Sacrosanct. Next to religion, the most sacrosanct thing is education. You know? Right? Look, so look at the strategies that are being deployed here. To advance certain arguments, we'll return to this matter on Thursday.